Hello everyone and welcome to our first session of Lock and Learn here with Alien Gear Holsters. So today I have Bob Smith from the Fernand Rod and Gun here in Northern Idaho uh, to go ahead and talk to us about some uh, range etiquette and some other questions of that nature today. Uh, so let's start off with Bob, can you tell us, aside from just Fernand Rod and Gun, more about yourself? Thank, uh, thank you Patrick, appreciate it and thanks for having me on the show sir. Yeah, really appreciate you coming. Um, Background-wise, uh, uh, like most of us in the gun industry, wear a lot of different hats. But um, being one not to uh, reinvent the wheel, uh, I was fortunate when um, starting Fernand Rodden Gun Club that I was already the Idaho Range Technical Team Advisor for the National Rifle Association's Range Division. So I didn't have to reinvent the wheel. Uh, NRA has a good program on range development, and I was able to uh, utilize the uh, source manual uh, and other so-called Bibles as that to start Fernand Rodden Gun Club. Uh, Fernand Rodden Gun Club is a 501c3 uh, federal IRS nonprofit as well as state of Idaho nonprofit. And we're the only uh, joint civilian, military, and police range on federal property in the state of Idaho. Um, kind of a cooperative agreement. We operate under a special use permit for the United States Forest Service. And we have a partnership with the Idaho Fish and Game. So between our um, a nonprofit corporation for Nand Rodden Gun Club Inc. and Fish and Game and Forest Service, uh, we've built, to my knowledge, the largest NRA affiliate in the state at this time. That's awesome. That's really cool. I really appreciate that. So, Bob, you mentioned uh, that it is a joint military, law enforcement, and civilian range. Uh, can you tell us about the unique dynamic that that kind of creates for your range? Well, I've always been a big supporter of law enforcement, and uh, to me, uh, support your local law enforcement went 
beyond putting a bumper sticker on your car. Fortunately, the very first range conference that I was able to go to uh, via NRA as a range technical team advisor was in Missouri. And Missouri Department of Fishing Game and one of their Department of Lands, uh, one of the facilities they operated was a joint civilian, military, and police range. Okay. So we uh, liked the idea. We decided to go the same way. Uh, as it's turned out over the many years that passed since the range was started in 1989, uh, under a memo of understanding with Forest Service, and then in 1990, our original permit, a uh, special use permit. As time has uh, passed, a lot of the places where, for instance, local law enforcement used to shoot, uh, like many shooting areas for surveillance, has become built up by urban encroachment, homes, you name it. So a lot of the places that used to be available in even our rural area are no longer available to shoot on. Okay. So today, fortunately, because of us, uh, local law enforcement and actually federal, state, and local law enforcement still have a nice range to shoot at, uh, thankfully for the foresight we had in building this facility. That's really cool. So it's my understanding that as part of this, uh, not only are you the director and founder of it, uh, but you serve as a range officer for there. That's correct, sir. Uh, so what does that in entail? What does being a range officer uh, have, wow, if I could speak. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, at, at Fernand, again, we tried to take some pages out of other people's books, not reinvent the wheel. Uh, at our range, uh, like most ranges, uh, we have a variety of range officers. We have a gentleman who's our chief range officer, uh, uh, Jeff White. Uh, all of us, including our club president, John Mahan, our secretary treasurer, August Fox, um, both our vice presidents, uh, Terry Tremblay and, and Tim Clark. Uh, I'm sorry. Um, uh, all have, uh, I said Tim Clark, excuse me, um, wrong Tim. So uh, anyway, um, all of them are also range officers. Basically what entails in that, Patrick, is we have a set of rules and regs mm -hmm. posted around the facility. Okay. What our club does is everyone that joins goes to what's called a mandatory safety check. It's an admin function only, where you don't have to demonstrate anything particularly, but we apply it to everyone. You could have been the former range master at Quantico with the FBI, or a complete newbie you're all going to go through the same thing. Okay. That way everybody gets the same page on fundamental basic ranges, uh, range rules and administrative rules that every facility has, which may differ. And then you get to see the idiosyncrasies physically of any facility, which may differ from one to another. When you're done with that, we have a signed copy, you have a signed copy, we're on the same page, and we all agree these are the range of rules that we all adhere to. And um, a person has issued their ID tag and their POX card, we have electric, electronic gate access. Uh, which records coming and goings based on your ID card. And then you're able to come out the range pretty much any time you want within our set hours awesome. and use the facility. Very cool. Um, so as a part of that, you went over that there's a bunch of rules. And mm -hmm. uh, so a lot of these places, they uh, a lot of people understand like range etiquette. Mm -hmm. And for a lot of people, range etiquette can vary from location of country uh, to, you know, just different habits that they've formed over the years. Absolutely. Um, so for you, what is the true or the appropriate range etiquette that people should be displaying while they're at the Ferdinand Ronald Gun. We actually covered that, but I'll, I'll, I'll try and be generic. And <clears throat> we start out with what used to be Jeff Cooper's four cardinal rules of uh, gun safety. And uh, we start with those, then move into more specific range rules, then uh, your admin rules, etc. But for any place you go, if you can stick with the four cardinal rules, and number one is that all guns are loaded. Now, obviously, that's being kind of euphemistic. They're not all loaded, but we treat them as though, all, as though they're always loaded at all times, regardless of known condition. Second is what we call muzzle control. You don't point the gun at anything you don't want to shoot and damage, injure, whatever. Third is you keep your finger off the trigger until you're on target and ready to fire. And the fourth is uh, know your target, what's behind it, what's around it, etc. If you stick with those four fundamentals, no matter where you go, the most important of which is, in my opinion, even though it's not the number one, is muzzle control. Oh, yes. If you mess up in any of the others, if you, at least you have the muzzle in safe direction, there won't be any serious property damage, hopefully of downrange berm, something of that nature, <laughs> but no warm fuzzy hides being perforated, et cetera, et cetera. Correct. So we've seen people do stupid things in videos with firearms and it happens all the time, regardless as to whether or not people know the rules. What's the strangest thing you've seen somebody try to do at the range? Probably, um, we have a very good safety record, thankfully, because we're very hardcore uh, on our rules and regs. <clears throat> Usually, 
if something's occurring, it's some violation of one of those fundamental rules. Oh, yes. um, somebody not adhering to the safe distances for use of steel. Eye and ear wear are huge. Okay, we're absolute proponents and requirements of anybody on the firing lines that have proper eyewear and ear protection. Um, obviously, guns are allowed. You will incur hearing loss over time if you, and you actually one instance can occur it if you don't have proper ear pro in. Eye damage can occur, uh, it, not necessarily even from the gun, but perhaps a piece of debris kicks back off the riding, some yeah. of that, that nature. Dust kick up. Dust kick up, anything like, you know, uh, that type of thing. So eye and ear wear would be paramount. An overall otherwise etiquette is that muzzle control. Uh, you will not make yourself more quickly persona non grata at a range than to sweep other people with a gun. Sweeping meaning cover them with your muzzle in some manner. Uh, that's actually a no-go. Uh, the next following thing is when on the line, uh, if there is a range master assigned, not following the range commands, for instance, a ceasefire. Okay. When you hear ceasefire, that doesn't mean after I finish my magazine, uh, these next two in my cylinder, that means right now, immediate stop, and then discover why the ceasefire was uh, initiated. Okay, cool. Uh, so you mentioned that a good way to get yourself kicked off the range is of course to flag people with the muzzle. Uh, has there ever been any other reason that you've had to kick somebody off of the range? Um, we have. Um, I want to back up on that and the reason we do it. NRA has four fundamentals of range development and building. That's what we call the four E's. And that's to evaluate your project, okay. engineer the project, and build it, okay, and then educate everyone in the proper use of the range, and then finally, back to the rules and regs, enforcement, the four E's, enforcement in the proper use. Even though we may educate, and their analogy is you can build the safest lawnmower in the world, but if somebody decides to put their hand under while it's running, it's not the machine's fault. Yeah, so same thing here. So generally we have had um, some temporary suspensions in our range, and we've actually had some expulsions. It's in our bylaws, it's part of our rules and regs. If a person cannot adhere to those, um, nobody in our range officer cadre is going to have to call Patrick's wife and say, we weren't hardcore on rules, right. hence Patrick's injured. That's not happened in our range, never has, isn't going to. So we actually have some people who are no longer members or even accessible to the range because of their behavior. And do you have any examples of what those behaviors were? Yes, uh, one individual went out and uh, decided to throw a piece of steel out probably 20 feet in front of him. Okay. I was going to shoot it with an M1 Grand. Oh. And oh. one of us happened to walk up and catch him and thankfully stopped it. And uh, he couldn't get, oh well, he goes, well 20 feet, well you should put some markers out here, then what's the difference between 20 feet and 100 yards? My answer was, if you can't tell 20 feet from 100 yards, you don't need to be out here shooting. Okay, wrong first answer. Uh, in being, having been a law enforcement trainer, uh, you pull something like that, everything else starts going downhill. It's kind of like what we used to call the attitude check question, which is when you're pulled over. Yeah. Sir, do you know why I pulled you over today? If you start BSing at that point, just consider it's all going to go downhill from there. Yeah. That's what this guy did. <laughs> it went downhill from there. <laughs> you just created a, a spiraling trend for downward. Yeah. And the problem is not just how to get injured himself, Patrick, but other people, perhaps new to the game, yeah. they come out, they see him, they think that's okay. Exactly. And we can't set that example and we don't allow it. So that kind of leads me to my next question. Yes, sir. So, uh, say I'm going to your range for the first time, mm -hmm. relatively new to firearms. Uh, what is your advice to me? When you're going out uh, at our range, if you haven't been through the safety check, let's say, for instance, you're coming out as a first day, as a person on the public day. Mm -hmm. So on days we have it open the public, our ROs are present to supervise it, but we do have just what you described. We have people coming out to the facility that have not been through the safety briefing. They may not know all the safety rules, may be complete newbies. We see that a lot, obviously. Yeah. And that's a great place to come to learn and, and learn the rules. So when you first show up at anybody's range, the first time you're not sure about how to shoot, when you're carrying your equipment, it's definitely highly recommended that you have your firearms cased. Your pistol in the case or holstered. If you're in a state that you can still carry whatever you're carrying, leave it in the holster. Leave it in the case. If it's a long gun, ideally in the case. If you do not have a case, carry the gun, muzzle up. Do not do what we call suitcase carry. Okay, that means you've got the gun with the muzzle this way and the stock this way, which means every time you walk with the gun, you're sweeping everybody at whatever level, and, and we can't tell if your gun's loaded or not, perhaps. Okay? Right. And what's the number one rule? All guns are loaded. So if somebody goes, it's not loaded, that would be the wrong answer. 
you have to presume it is, which means, what? Number two, we're sweeping everyone with the muzzle. You're flying so the answer, you're Absolutely. So to answer your question, sir, show up with your guns cased, otherwise muzzles up, empty, all firearms empty until you're on the line, and then once you're there, follow the range officer for whatever facility, certainly ours, and whatever else I'm sure would be the same, follow their uh, advice, directions, and commands to have a nice, safe day at the range. So uh, they've gone through, they've learned their safety, um, they're starting to fire. What are the most common mistakes um, that you see, whether it be in their stance, um, their fight, their grip of the firearm? What are the most common mistakes you see out on the range? The biggest thing we see, particularly on public days, is unfamiliarity with the firearm they brought. Whether it be a handgun, rifle, shotgun, doesn't matter. Uh, commonly you see someone who's not familiar with the proper manipulative skills for that firearm, okay. uh, what we call the manual of arms. They're not quite sure how to open the bolt, how to hold it open. Does the safety go this way or that way? Uh, much less, is it loaded or not? Yeah. So uh, that's one of the things we try and jump on first is to make sure uh, they're somewhat comfortable with the operation of the gun. And then from that point, uh, the fundamental rules with a constant emphasis on muzzles downrange. Okay, awesome. Uh, and so I know earlier we talked a little bit about uh, the different stances. Yes, sir. Uh, from the weaver stance to the uh, isosceles stance. Uh, why don't you uh, break that down for them? Well, as far as pistol work goes, the three classic stances is a uh, uh, weaver or modified weaver slash Chapman and then the isosceles. So those are three basic positions the human body can get into since man was throwing rocks at each other and whatnot. So as far as pistol work goes, uh, any um, I consider bona fide instructor will teach you all three of those which one you choose as a primary is ultimately up to you, your body shape, your body style, type of equipment you're carrying, whatever. But in my opinion, one should learn and know all three of those stances mm -hmm. because in certain stressful conditions, you will fall back automatically just because of the way your body positions itself on one of those three fundamentals. Our goal, Patrick, is not to, let's say I'm what we used to call a weaver beaver. You know, Jeff Cooper guy, which is how I started out. The one true religion is the weaver, right? Okay. Well, just because it's good for me, doesn't mean it might be good for someone else. So ultimately, as I learned, like with Master U with LFI, you learn all three, you pick which one you like, you like your, that's your medicine you choose, but if you know them all, you can be confident in whatever body position you are. We don't try and make robots of you. We're gonna show you everything. Right. You take what's best for you with that, leave what else you don't like. Perfect. And so, I, I know here in Idaho, we're pretty open with the firearms that you can bring. Um, would there be any firearms that you say we were in Washington? Mm -hmm. You deal a lot with it in Washington. Mm -hmm. um, so say we we're in Washington, are there any firearms that you wouldn't be allowed to bring to the range over in Washington? Well, first, our club's an Idaho-based club out of Coeur d'Alene. <clears throat> but since we're on the state line, uh, over a third of our membership is from Washington State. They come to our range in Idaho to shoot. Idaho is um, more classically liberal, if you will as to what some of us jokingly call the People's Republic of Washington. Sorry, Washingtonians. Okay, I gotta throw a little shot in. My point being is, to answer your question, Patrick, is uh, we don't have near the firearms restrictions in Idaho that Washington does. And fortunately, our legislators have a tendency, and this is coming from a former cop trainer and an expert witness on use of force, uh, people perform behavior, not tools. So you can come to our range, dress however you want, bring whatever you want, <laughs> shoot however you want. Years ago, actually, uh, Washington had a big issue on camouflage, for instance. And a range I shoot at, I used to be the president of Spoken Valley Rifle and Pistol Club. They decided, no camouflage, whoa, whoa, whoa camouflage. <laughs> so people couldn't wear camo, okay? You couldn't show up in a match with camo because suddenly camo screamed strange ranger, mm. okay? So they did away with the camo and of course, there's also firearms. Ooh, there's, this is a bad gun and this is a good gun. Well, the so-called black rifles have been denigrated by some as a, as a bad thing. They're just tools, as we all know. Yes. All right. And uh, an example of that, I didn't find this out until uh, sometime later. I was at an archery store, as a matter of fact. Ran into a guy and he goes, oh, you're the jerk that runs that crowd out there. Went, oh, I'm sorry, what happened? <laughs> well, he was a captain in the Marine Reserves. He's heard about our shoots out there. He shows up late after a drill weekend, so he didn't get the change. Yeah. He shows up out there, he's in his fatigues, and it fatigues with a subdued insignia. Mm -hmm. And before he can get out of the parking lot, 
One of the people over there who bought into that, things are bad, not people, yells at him, you get out of here, we don't want your kind here. He's like, okay, he gets in his car and he leaves. Thankfully, I happened to run into him, totally indifferent, was able to short that out, straighten it out, and he came back and shot our matches. So clearly, we cannot judge the book by the cover. Yeah. Okay? I mean, uh, kind of like George Carlin used to go, you know, oh, Karl Marx had a beard, Gabby Hayes had whiskers, you know? <laughs> we, we, we don't judge people, thankfully, most of the time in America by what we wear, our hairstyles, etc., etc. So one of the things that happened when I started the club at Fernand, mm -hmm. I wanted to make sure we didn't do that kind of thing. Yeah. So you come to Fernand, you can shoot matches there, you can do whatever you want, we don't care what you wear, we don't care what you shoot, as long as you do it in a safe manner. Awesome. And I'll give you an example, back as I was telling you uh, beforehand, when the club started in uh, 1989 and 1990, it was during Desert Shield. So the National Guard helped us build the facility. So you got a lot of troopies out there in their camo, doing their thing, and we have one of our matches in there. Matches that encompassed civilians and police officers and military. Yep. Okay, one was the chief of police from the Spokane at that time, Terry Mangan. He chose to shoot in his uniform, okay? We had two guys out there in camo shooting with their whole foot gear, their LBE, their helmets, the whole nine yards. Why? They're getting ready to get shipped out to the sandbox for Desert Storm. Yep. Okay? Their big beef back then was the military didn't have enough ammo to practice. So they'd come shoot our three gun shoots. Yeah. Well, some lady shoots, some, some shows up and she bought into this stuff. She's an observer. And she goes, I can't believe you that people like that shoot. I said, what are we talking about, ma'am? Those wannabes out there. I said, well, actually, they're, they're not wannabes. They're the real thing. That guy's in a Marine, he's a Marine, and that guy's Army. And they're practicing with their privately owned they are 15s because they want to have more training when they go to war. Makes sense. And thankfully, both those guys came home safe, and they both attribute a lot of it to the practice they got to do at our facility, uh, like any other gun club across the country, with their own privately owned AR-15s. And um, so once again, we look at behavior out there. Yes. You don't do something safely, we're gonna call you on it. You show up in whatever you wanna wear, whatever you're shooting. Uh, <laughs> now we have some limitations, um, mainly ammo for during the fire season. Tracer, incendiary, explosive, prohibited. Um, we do make certain exceptions to groups. It's an exception to the rule to based upon fire conditions. In other words, you might get through one of those in the middle of winter when there's snow on the ground, but not in the summer and higher fire season. Yeah. Everything else is pertaining to behavior with firearms, so we don't prohibit any specific firearms. Okay, cool. So, without prohibiting any specific firearms, uh, what is your favorite rifle and why? Well, um, probably because of my age and, uh, and generation and whatnot, one of my favorites to shoot and use is an M1A. And of course, now they have the shorter versions like the M1, uh, one, M1A SOCOM and our scout type versions, things of that nature. I have probably one of each, a typical gun collector type <laughs> of guy, right? Um, so that would be primary. However, over years of practicality, because the standard platform for law enforcement training, military training, is the AR platform, um, which of course we know is based up for, is designed, it's um, AR for armor light, not automatic rifle or assault rifle. Thank you. Okay. So, <laughs> and that's because the media has a tendency to sometimes innocently, sometimes not so innocently, conflate the two. So, uh, the AR platform is very popular in America today, oh, yes. also called the Modern Sporting Rifle. One of the most popular fire platforms used for across the board activities. Um, and I want to make a comment on note. Um, I've heard people say, as we all have, that gun's only for killing, and this is only for killing. Well, I gotta tell you right now, American citizens fire every year trillions, that's with a T, not a B, trillions of rounds of ammunition at ranges with nobody ever getting killed, okay? Many of them are guns like that. If they were only for killing, then obviously we'd have a lot of deaths. If they were only for killing, then police officers carrying them would not be able to control them, okay? Um, Anytime I've ever pulled any of my firearms, much less an AR, out of the safe, it has never sent me some secret about telepathy to go hit the nearest stop and rob. <laughs> so they're inanimate objects, and as an expert witness on the subject, whenever I'm at a trial over defense counsel, or if it's my table, defense counsel, depending on which side I'm on, 
Um, there's never a gun, a knife, a gallon of gasoline, a stick of dynamite, whatever at the defense town. It's a person. So guns can't kill things. We can kill things with a gun. We can cut things with a knife. But guns and knives don't do those things by themselves. I know it bears repeating, but it should be simple, but as we all know, it's lost on some. That does happen. So, how about your favorite pistol? Um, probably my primary, just because of um, what I grew up with. I, I'm generally a 1911 carrier, and uh, I carry every day, matter for many, many years. The only time I did not carry was when I was on duty, because uh, my primary occupation for 42 years was firefighter paramedic. The only time I didn't carry was when I'm working. Well, I'm retired now, so I carry all the time. Um, and I'll just finish with a note, uh, like my students used to ask when I was teaching, uh, Bob, when, I sh when should I carry? And my answer was, when do you put a seatbelt on? If we could see it coming, the accident down the road, we wouldn't go down that road. So the handguns are on us because they're handy. Um, if we thought there was a problem we're going into, hopefully we either avoid, detour, or whatever, or like a police officer has to do, he goes against a real gun for a gunfight. He pulls the rifle and the shotgun out of the trunk. Correct. So, uh, that's uh, pretty much what we have planned out for questions wise yeah. here. Uh, do we have any questions that have popped up in chat? I have one. Go How ahead. How many Nikki. times have you seen people do the hot brass dance? Oh, that's an excellent question. <laughs> we highly recommend, and in some classes require, a ball cap. Also, a high collar shirt, not the v neck, things of that nature. Particularly female students, and of the 10,000 people I trained over years, 70% uh, were women. Okay, V-neck, particularly for a lady with a bust, is a big brass catcher. Oh, yes. Okay, <laughs> same for guys. A uh, matter of fact, just the other day, I did the same thing. Brass went down the back of my shirt. Okay, own up to it. Get your finger off the trigger. Stay still. If you have to move and do the brass dance, that's fine. <laughs> Reach back and get it. But always keep the muzzle in a safe direction. Ideally, wear the hat, tight shirt. The brass doesn't go down to begin with and burn you. And um, it, that, that's an excellent question. It's avoidable, <laughs> but most importantly when it happens, don't lose control of the gun and where the muzzle is. Great question. That's a good question. Uh, what are your thoughts on uh, black powder use at the range? Black powder? Yeah. Uh, we have black powder use at the range because, again, we let everything be shot out there. So, you know, if it's a legitimate uh, thing, that we, you know, which black powder is. Um, the biggest thing with black powder is, uh, again, it's more volatile than standard gunpowder. So um, one has to be careful in its usage because of its increased volatility, particularly in the summer season for fire hazard. Obviously. Um, I gotta be honest with you, it gets back to behavior thing again. Uh, we used to um, allow people to smoke on the firing line and we prohibited that. It's and one of the things that directly came from was a black powder shooter. Oh, yeah. Had his revolver up here, he's loading the cylinder. And his idea of how to load was have a cigarette in his hand Pick up a pound of black powder with a cigarette in the ash right here. <laughs> and I walked up and no, 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 no. And we put the nicks on that. We're going to need to put the fire away from the black Take powder. Take the fire away from the black powder. So we just said, you know what? We're not anti-smoking. We don't care what you do. Most people don't today. I, I thank God I never started smoking. Uh, too many years of seeing emphysema patients. Glad I never went down that path. But we took the embers off the range for those reasons and we don't allow smoking on our firing line. Now you can smoke elsewhere on the range within like gravel areas for fire hazard reasons. We don't want to start a fire in, in the forest. But um, <clears throat> no, black powder is certainly welcome and it's a great sport and great fun. Awesome. Uh, Alan from YouTube is asking, uh, could you talk about having paid legal representation or services when you can seal carry? Uh, it's pushed in the CCL classes it makes it sound like you'd be crazy not to have it. However, he, however, he wants to know what your thoughts are. I think that's an excellent question. I do too. And I think you'd be sold. The, you're being largely sold a bunch of insurance you probably don't need. That's you, you want my opinion right off the bat. Here's the number one insurance you need. This is a quote from Masada U, formerly Lethal Force Institute, now Masada U Group. In the years I taught, I'm gonna give you the quote. In the years I taught, I back then nobody had insurance. There wasn't even insurance available for instructors, much less for people carrying. What's happened is people, in my opinion, people have seen a niche, get in there. I mean, what's some of the wealthiest co companies in the world? Insurance. Because you pay, never have claims. It's a great business to be in, not knocking the insurance industry. 
Because when you need it, you're damn glad you had a house policy, car policy, whatever. The number one insurance is know what in the hell you're doing. Okay? Act to the standard by which you expect to be judged, and you will never be found wanting in the judgment. That's what I see in a court of law. If you're able, you don't get in trouble and go to court and get arrested because you did wrong necessarily. You get in trouble, go to court and get arrested because of your failure to articulate that what you did was correct. If you cannot articulate that, you're in trouble. And insurance is not going to help you later to much degree. So learn, train. When you buy a gun, go out and buy three times as much ammo. <laughs> okay, and go practice and become proficient with that firearm. Seek out competent instruction. Okay, I say that because I go back to the 80s with the instructors from that era. And as time has transpired, I'm glad to see so many instructors out there. But even this day, I see, as Mass puts it, those out there teaching that which they have not learned yet. <laughs> so look at the person's bio, look at their resume, make sure they're getting what you need. If it's Hunter Ed, you're going to go get a Hunter Ed instructor with those kind of credentials. Yep. If it's, it's self-defense, you're going to get people that have bona fide self-defense credentials. Get those and use them. Now, there are companies out there, and here's what I'm going to suggest, without naming any companies, because we're not pitching here. Um, the one that I do support, I support for a reason. When you join it, you get a ton of videos on this entire topic, not today's topic, but on use of force topics that is well worth the price of entry, the premium, if you will, or the initial dues. So you're immediately getting something because their philosophy is like mine. Learn this material. Here's things you need to know on these CDs, etc., etc. Read and learn these things. Study this information before you go forth with your loaded firearm. Okay? The others, to my knowledge, I'm not intimately familiar with each one of them, are largely selling you a policy Okay, here you get in trouble, Patrick, you and I can pull on this policy. Keep in mind, they're not going to defend you if you did the wrong thing. <laughs> if you did a criminal act, intentionally or otherwise, you're SOL. Okay, but I can tell you this, the last big trial I was involved in was a $300,000 trial. Now, we all took it pro bono, the attorneys, myself, the other expert, because we, we believe what the guy did. We got a unanimous acquittal and he went home safe to his family. Thankfully, it was Washington State. Washington's the only state in the Union where if you were found, um, um, you're acquitted by a rule of self-defense, that takes two acquittals. One, acquittal of the charges. Second, a jury finding that the case was self-defense. The state has to pay all the legal fees. Yep. So that 300K came from the state, and that's what ultimately paid the attorneys and guys like me. Even though we had no expectation of it, you keep your hours, your billables, etc. if for nothing else for tax rally at the end of the year. Uh, there, that's only one state out of 50. The rest of them aren't gonna have it, and I don't know about you, but I don't keep 300 grand on my mattress for just in case. I'd rather do it right the first time, and the final parallel, I'll say on that, 30 of my 42 years in emergency service as a paramedic, I never carried malpractice either malpractice insurance. Plan A is don't kill and injure your patient, how about? <laughs> so that's my philosophy. Do it right, don't screw up, you probably won't need any of that insurance stuff. Good do you question. Have, uh, do you have any requirements for children on the range learning? Is there a height age requirement that you... That's a good question as well. That's a parental, con that's a parental area of, uh, of concern. What we watch for when somebody comes out, and this is generally manifested on public days, not our general membership and whatnot. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> we really watch because I've seen things myself out there. You asked for examples, Patrick, of what yes. you've seen. I saw a gentleman out there one day with his kids, and we had to kind of put the kibosh on some of it because he really wasn't watching the kids. He wanted to shoot, let the kids shoot. This kid's like 10 years old. Now, some 10-year-olds, or probably can be more proficient and safe than another adult. In this case, this was not the case. And the kid was having a lot of time, a lot of difficulty manipulating the firearm. The dad wasn't paying attention. We kind of stepped in and made it, you know, one gun, one time under dad's supervision. Yes. The problem is in this, dad didn't know anything more than the kid did. So we try and step in and 
it's a delicate situation. We don't want to embarrass anybody. Um, so you try and come in and be a teacher and teach the correct things, share with the dad, share with the wife, share with the kids so everybody gets a good learning experience, comes back with some lessons learned. Yeah. It's not in there, flog, I'm showing them what you know time. Um, we're there to serve the public as, as ROs and whatnot. We're there to make it a fun experience at the range, a safe experience at the range, and hopefully be teachers as well yeah. and make it a good experience. So, and with that, remember that we're only talking about the Fernand Road. <coughs> that is correct. So, your local range may have different requirements on that. So, make sure you check with them before you take your child out there. That's actually true, Patrick. And uh, you might go over to one of the local ranges here or wherever else they might be. Ask them those requirements. At Fernand, um, we leave it up to the parents with some supervision by us if need be. And I can tell you right now, for instance, that our apple seed shoots. Um, we have a cross-section, it's one of the greatest shoots for kids because we see multi-generational. We see the, the grandkids, the parents, and the grandparents all have to shoot in the same match and they shoot what's called the Apple Qualification Target. AQ2 is, AQT is also the Army Qualification Target. Yes. So they're shooting the same course of fire and qualification that our soldiers do in the armed services. Um, instead of a green target or a brown target, it's a red target because it goes back about American history also and the red coats and things yes, of that nature. Exactly. Yeah, but it's all, all, all age groups and all have varying skill levels. The main thing is we all do it safely regardless of age. Exactly. Uh, Katrina on uh, Facebook has asked, uh, pre earlier you mentioned um, you frequently see people who don't know how to handle the specific weapon that they brought with them. Um, if they don't have a buddy who knows the weapon, um, how do they find a place to learn except trial and error at the range? That's an that's question. excellent question. Very good question. I won't say we frequently see it out there, but of the things we see, um, manual of arms, lack of knowledge thereof, is probably one of the highest. So what I would suggest, and some of the ranges around here do it, I know one of the local indoor ranges in Idaho here does it, um, when you buy a gun, they have an option they'll help train you with the, that manual of arms of that gun. So the nice thing is, whatever gun you bought, whether it be a rifle, shotgun, handgun of some type, they're gonna teach you how to use it. You should never, today particularly, back in the day when I first started teaching, there wasn't a whole lot out there. There were only a few of us out teaching. Today, there's a plethora of instructors of all types out there. As I mentioned earlier, you should be able to get what you need in terms of going to the range with some competent instruction. Okay. I'm going to say this particularly to you guys watching. Get over the testosterone overdose. Okay? When your wife or your girlfriend or the kids get a gun and you may not know about it, quit doing the macho mamba. I'm the man. I will teach you this. Okay? I made that mistake years ago in my marriage trying to teach my wife how to drive a stick shift. Okay, for the rest of the marriage, we drove automatic transmission cars. All it took was my second, don't let fly the damn clutch. And that was it. We were done with the transmission. So, if you haven't got the patience or you haven't got the knowledge, take them to a range or a facility where you can get competent instruction. If you were to show up on a public day, for instance, at our range with a brand new gun, you could ask one of our ROs, hey, I just bought this. I don't know how it works. Our guys are going to say, fantastic, let me help you. Awesome. And we'll show you how to, whatever gun it is, whatever you bring, believe me, it's one of our people who know how to <laughs> operate it. And um, this is not the tool to guess with. <laughs> if you got your digital camera, you don't know how it works, you're going to, oh, 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 click, oh, sorry, Patrick. Okay, <laughs> if it's a handgun, uh, uh, bang! That's not what we want. You know that what? has greater replication. So the answer to that is uh, get with someone who does know, go to a safe facility like a range, where if you do mess up, the bullet goes down range, and learn about that gun. Excellent question. Um, how do you feel about constitutional carry and should all you carriers get some kind of training before they carry? I am a huge advocate of training. I am not an advocate of mandatory training. And the reason being, I've seen different states and they, some people with government will utilize training uh, and it will be completely turned around on what you think it is and it will be used as a mechanism to deny your civil rights. You should be trained. 
the motto of my old school, SAFE, was it's your right to own a firearm, it's your responsibility to use it wisely and safely. Okay, rights have commensurate duties and responsibilities. Just like voting, anything like that is a civil right, it's not just your right. There's responsibilities to go with it. Certainly this is true with firearms. So, it is incumbent upon us as gun owners, our own responsibilities to ourselves, our families, and to the lay public, to know what the hell we're doing with that tool we bought. Okay, now, seek out competent instruction as we described earlier, learn how to use that gun. As far as constitutional carry, we're talking back to carry versus concealed carry. I get the concept, I've been a supporter for years, ever since uh, Vermont was the only state that's continued to have constitutional carry. Idaho now has it. <coughs> Along with that comes the issue of open versus concealed. Okay, if you're going to carry a firearm for self-defense, my experience, and this is going back on you know, my days off from fire 30 years as a civilian police instructor, having taught in Africa, Central and South America, and all over the United States, <clears throat> if you're going to carry, carry concealed. All right? If I'm going to go rob a bank and I've cased it, guess who's going to get it first? The bank guard. He is a quantifiable, identifiable threat. Okay? If you're walking around with your gun on, out in the open, some people think, oh, if people see me, that will deter me. Uh, might, the lightweight, the more heavyweight, just going to come around and cap you in the back of the head before you know you got a problem. Okay? Do not give up, do not give intel to your defensive tactics or methods, whether it be locks and alarms at home, what kind of gun you carry, when you carry it, where you carry it. Exactly. Do not give that up. Okay? So, I don't want to spend too much time on it, but uh, have the proper training. And the proper training is not necessarily mandated training, okay? You don't have to stop if you have mandated training, like say a state night to get your enhanced. Take the class, it's good. Yeah. But you're not done yet, okay? Most carry permits in most states are simply primarily a background check. Okay, it's like when I got my pilot's license. I solo, I got out, went to go get my license, and my instructor said, now you have a license to learn how to fly. There's a lot more training to go down the road. Okay. And so it is with carry permits. Do you compete professionally? Not professionally. I used to be an A-class of six shooter. Um, uh, I wish I had the video today. Back in the day, I had a great, we had a, a drill called the Mikulik. And that was named after Jerry Mikulik. And uh, it was a great target. One of my friends had the video. I, like I say, as you get older, you look back and you go, man, I was much faster than Patrick than I remember today. <laughs> but literally, the same thing. Uh, in that <laughs> shot, yeah, you draw and as you palm heel this head, you shoot two rounds to the chest, you pivot two rounds here, pivot two rounds here, targets over here. He has me doing that on video and all six pieces of brass are still in the frame of the video. Wow. It was really fast. Okay. <laughs> I don't shoot that fast anymore. <laughs> okay. Point being is, no, I do not um, professionally at a level compete. I do shoot, I try to shoot at least our match every month at the club. Third Saturday of each month at Fernand, we have a great three-gun competition. Now, it's great fun. We have what we call outlaw matches, which means we're not associated with IDPA or IPSC. IDPA being the International Defensive Pistol Association, IPSC, International Practical Shooters Conference. So, and USPSA, U.S. Practical Shooters Association. Uh, I happen to belong to those organizations, um, and I was a... a, a an original member of IPSC when Jeff Cooper started it back in the mid-70s. Wow. However, um, I shoot our, when I say an outlaw match, simply means we don't report those organizations, scores, things of that nature. We don't pay dues. We just go out and have fun shoots. The nice thing about them is you come out if you're a complete newbie, you've never shot a three gun, come out, people will coach you through. There, there won't be some kind of a hard-ass scorekeeping you might have in a sanctioned match. For instance, I'm shooting past the RO, I might think I'm done, and Pat's going to go, Oh, thanks, man. <laughs> boom, 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 right, shoot. You won't see that in a sanctioned match. We're there for you to have fun, safely, etc. There are many other kind of competitions, particularly in our region. Um, check them out. Go shoot them. If you've never shot a match, don't be afraid to go do it the first time. You'll have a lot of fun. And one thing it does give you, in addition to the camaraderie and the fun which you'll have around other shooters, oh, yeah. you will have weapons manipulations. 
You're running your pistol, you're running your shotgun, you're running your rifle. Okay? So you're getting manipulations, training the whole time. Manipulations, transitions. Exactly. So it's fantastic, Patrick. It's a great way to do it. Um, check them out. Ours is third Saturday each month at Fernand Rodden Gun Club. Three gun, great family event. That's about it. That's it. All right. Well, Bob, I really want to thank you a lot. Patrick, thanks a lot for having time. me, sir. Thanks it was a lot of fun. I think we got a lot of great information out of it. Yeah. So I really enjoyed it. Some great questions from everybody. It's my pleasure, too. Yeah. So for everyone that's local, um, what is a web address they can go to to thank check you. out the club? Fernand Rodden Gun Club is real simple, www.frgc.org. That's for Fernand Rod and Gun Club, FRGC. The email is equally simple, frgc at frgc.org. And the club telephone number is 208-773-3624. Awesome. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. Thank you.